Hey gamers, quick ad break. As you probably know by now, the Beyond Solitaire podcast is proudly sponsored by Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations. And that is a project that I'm super excited about because I believe that learning through play is the best way to do it. And the CLGS is making it happen in college classrooms and hopefully high school ones. Part of that initiative is Games Press. If you want to back their first successful Kickstarter project, pre-orders for Monumental Consequence by Dr. Mary Beth Looney are open now. And keep an eye out for Rising Waters, designed by Dr. Scout Bloom. This is an upcoming game about the Mississippi flood of 1927, one of the worst natural disasters in American history. And I will be interviewing Dr. Bloom about it on this podcast in the coming weeks. Thanks so much, and let's get started with the show. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and this week on the pod I have a very special guest. I have Ev Davis, also known as Whistler. He is a LARPer, tabletop RPG expert, writer, and artist. How are you doing, Ev? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome. I'm so happy to have you on here. So uh, for those of you who are wondering how we met, which I will just assume you are, uh, Ev and I met at a playtest of Monumental Consequence uh, by Mary Beth Looney. And we'd known each other before that through the Yale community, but uh, Ev has great things to say about LARPs and tabletop RPG, things that I know very little about, which is why you're on here <laughs> to... <laughs> <laughs> to answer my questions but first off you are uh the new author of an upcoming tabletop game yourself do you want to tell us about rap uh yeah sure um it is a pbta powered by the apocalypse game a tabletop game uh, about pirates uh magical pirates on fun adventures um and um there should be a a preview of the game a free preview online uh sometime in the next month uh, i'm waiting on my publisher for that uh, but yeah, I'll, uh, hopefully it'll be out by the time this airs and I'll, I'll send a link to it. Awesome. So when you say PBTA, what, what does it mean to be powered by the apocalypse? That's a great question. Uh, so I think the, the bread and butter for a lot of people of tabletop games is obviously Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, that's the milestone, I think, the, or, or maybe the gateway drug, uh, depending on who you ask. Um, and Dungeons and Dragons is a lot of people assume that it's sort of the baseline for RPGs uh, because it's so ubiquitous, and that's not necessarily true. Uh, it's it's definitely from a tradition of war gaming and strategy gaming, um, and in that it uh, creates this really great casual experience. But I think a lot of people uh, assume that if they take the mechanical structure of D and D and supplant it into other systems that say, let's like, Oh, let's make an urban fantasy. Let's make a red wall game. Let's make, you know, that kind of thing. It'll work just fine. And uh, it's a dangerous assumption to make because you're supplanting a war game. You're, you're making strategy game mechanics um, or like what used to be strategy game mechanics. Um, and I would recommend powered by the apocalypse as an alternative to that, uh, Powered by the Apocalypse uh, originated as uh, a game called Apocalypse World by Vincent Baker, who actually I think lives in my area. Uh, and he was generous enough to put the structure of Apocalypse World, which was originally Mad Max style, you know, a uh, uh, game about post-apocalyptic uh, scavengers in a desert wasteland environment. Uh, he was generous enough to put it on essentially Creative Commons. So anyone can attempt to supplant that structure into another game. And it's become very popular because it's not so much a structure as a, a vague framework. Uh, and in fact, I would suggest if you want to get into making RPGs, making a Powered by the Apocalypse game is a great place to start because it forces you to think about how to shape the experience of your players, what exactly you're trying to get out of um, the tabletop RPG that you're making. Uh, and it's specifically a game that tries to frame the experience as a narrative one, as a collaborative story. Uh, so there are like beats that they try to hit. Uh, you still roll dice, which is uh, a pretty common mechanic in a lot of tabletops, uh, but it's not um, uh, every minute uh, as it might be with a D&D &D game, Dungeons and Dragons game. Uh, instead, you make moves, 
uh, which are triggered by the story. So in a pirate game, for instance, in Rapscallion, which I'll draw from here uh, since I made it, um, it's <laughs> uh, a, a, a common move might be um, do, use a dirty trick, get into a scrap, break in or out of something, um, twist your fate, things like that. Um, and those are the basic moves. Of, if, you, if you do one of those things in the narrative, that's when you roll a dice to see what happens. Um, and by making, and they're essentially like tiny little mini games you can think of them. Each time you roll it, there's like a variety of things that might happen that the game will tell you. And uh, I think the goal there is to focus the experience of the players into uh, specific categories, right? You're trying to think like a pirate. You're trying to make pirate moves. If you're not doing pirate moves, you don't need to roll the dice. That's not what the story is about. Um, and there's a lot more to it than that, but I would call that as the sort of the central framework of a PBTA or Powered by the Apocalypse story um, and uh, uh, Vincent Baker's framework. Oh, that's really interesting. Was Dungeons & Dragons your first tabletop experience? It's the only tabletop experience that I have other than little solo RPGs, so I'm just right. curious. I think it was, yeah. I, I started very late. I didn't really have any friends who were into it until I got to college. Um, but yes, I think I started with... 3.5 edition in college uh, and moved to 5e, the, the current edition of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and uh, I think at the same time, I also did World of Darkness stuff, which is its own can of worms for those of you who know World of Darkness. Uh, similar, similar to D&D in the sort of the central structure of it, um, but it's an urban fantasy about you know vampires and, and werewolves and so on. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay, so I, I want to go back to what you said about how sometimes we think of Dungeons and Dragons as like the base RPG. Mm. But I mean, I actually find it familiar because I play a lot of war games. And so its mechanisms right. for me seem very natural. How do you break out, you know, once you've been sort of conditioned to expect that this is how role playing works? What other kinds of experiences are out there for people who are ready to break that mold? That's a great question. Um... In my head, anyway, I've sort of categorized them into three options, um, vaguely, right? Like, there's obviously many ways in which you can approach an RPG, a, a role-playing experience, let's call it. Um, obviously, one of them is a war competitive style game where there is an assumed enemy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, the dungeon master, the game master, uh, will uh, roll their own dice for the enemy, and you have to beat them um, is the baseline assumption there. Obviously, that's where D and D comes from. Um, and then there's more narrative style games, and PBTA isn't the only one, obviously, but it's a sort of typical version of the genre. Um, and then there are games that I would describe as attempting a uh, a form of group therapy <laughs> or a, a cathartic experience. They're aiming for an emotional cathartic experience in a safe space. Um, and among those, I would, I would, maybe a good example would be the uh, No Dice, No Masters game, which does not include dice rolling at all. Um, an example might be Wander Home, uh, which I own a copy of. It's a great game um, where winning and losing are, is not even remotely close to the point. Um, and like, I, I think there are traps that one can go into if you don't frame your experience from that way, both as a player and as a creator of games. So if you have a, um, for instance, uh, if you come into Dungeons and Dragons and say, oh, I love to tell stories and I really want to like make this cool character. And then you happen to be in a group that doesn't really focus on that and focuses on, in fact, the things that Dungeons and Dragons is good at, uh, the combat and the, uh, the sort of dungeon crawling aspect. Um, you might end up being disappointed and not knowing why. And um, I think uh, I'm not going to call it out by name because I feel like that would be a little rude, but there was this game that I, that I stumbled upon that touted itself and had amazing art along the lines of this exploration game. You know, there's this deep fey jungle um, that uh, resists all attempts uh, of civilization to encroach it, right? And um, it, the, the, the 
game told sells of that as its main aspect of you exploring this jungle. It's like far too dangerous for any like mere mortal. Um, but you're still like going into it, trying to discover its secrets. And I was like, Oh, that's amazing. Right? Like that's something that I think Dungeons and Dragons doesn't do very well. Uh, it sometimes frames itself as an exploration game, but I've like GM professionally for a long time for Dungeons and Dragons. And it's not, there's not very many mechanics that do well for that. Anyone who, plays the ranger will will know that's the case and um i think uh i i sort of saw this game as uh, an outlet you know like a, a something i could i could i could use because i love exploration anytime i play a video game that's those are the ones i gravitate towards you know hollow knight uh things like that and unfortunately i was very disappointed to find that it the only mechanics it offered were combat ones it was very similar to D&D. It used a very similar dice system even. Um, and it had a very strict win-loss mechanic, which is another thing that typifies strategy games. You know, um, what I would call the neutral fail state. You are punished with boredom. Um, and that was really disappointing to me. And honestly, spite can be just as strong a fuel as exciting optimism. Because uh, I would love to make a game that is actually about exploration and not in a colonialist way like it often is with board games i think um but in a in a in a in a truly like exciting like the feeling of going into your backyard and 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 finding like this patch of woods and something like that i would love to do something that actually attempts that uh in a way that is non-combative you know uh but that's like a, a good example of of maybe a game that is trying to it had amazing art too, like this mysterious forest with these huge hulking figures in the background. Um, but again, a game that was trying to do something, but getting waylaid perhaps by um, the mechanics that D and D has sort of typified and codified in the genre. Interesting. So when you, uh, when you were designing Rep Scallion, what mm -hmm. did you want players to experience as pirates? Because we think about the swashbuckle part, right? With, I mean, you, you, we're talking about combat, but there are a lot of other aspects of being a pirate. How, how do you choose to structure that for yourself to create your own? I, I'm assuming it's some sort of ideal mm -hmm. experience that you wrote it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, that's a great question. Um, I think, so one of the one of the baseline assumptions D&D offers is that death is the final option. It's the final failure, right? That is the stakes that you die. Um, and I don't necessarily think that's true for pirates. You know, pirates only die when it's sufficiently dramatic to do so. Uh, so that's what we did with the game. And I think that's true of a lot of PBTA. PB, uh, Powered by the Apocalypse games are often death is not really the arbiter of things like if you're playing a high school drama death is like a weird anomaly right um for instance and um i think for rap scallion what we wanted was for there to be stakes obviously uh but the stakes are often you give in to your vices as a pirate you uh oh you start you start to uh get that greedy treasure lust again or, uh, oh, you fall in love with your opponent. Oh, no, the romance, the swashbuckling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's the kind of uh, story I wanted to tell. So a lot of the time, um, you know, you there's, uh, first of all, for Powered by the Apocalypse games, losing uh, or failing a dice roll is uh, framed differently as with many other games. Um, there's a sort of... Uh, hit or miss aspect where if you miss a dice roll in the parlance you uh instead the the story keeps going something happens um it's just something that might be outside of the player's control as opposed to inside it right there is right. this sort of like the basic level of um how much how much say do i have in what happens how good is that aspect related to me um so let's take one of the moves i mentioned earlier uh, of getting into a scrap. If you hit getting into a scrap, that means that you get to, you know, that's like the combat move, right? That's the move where you fight people. Um, and hitting that means not only that you might get to harm them or get into an advantageous position, but that maybe you take their stuff if you're really good, or um, you kind of get a scimitar to their throat and, and, and tell everyone to back off. 
or even that you gain sort of bond with them, which in this um, game means that you have some kind of connection that you can leverage. Um, and if you miss, you don't die necessarily. It just means that they get to do something to you. Maybe they kidnap you. Maybe they uh, uh, whip out a flamethrower and uh, start toasting your ship and you kind of are, are, are desperately trying to get there. Um, it, but whatever happens, the narrative continues and the narrative becomes interesting as a result of it. And that's sort of the biggest, if I had to describe like one difference between PBTA and like a Dungeons and Dragons system, uh, that would be it. Uh, and for me, that's kind of great for a pirate story because you can typify losing as uh, anything you want, essentially. Oh, that's really interesting. I love this idea of thinking about winning and losing and I guess conflict mm -hmm. differently because I, yeah. I think conflict doesn't always have to be fighting, but I, I mean, I think most games have conflict except maybe totally. things in that third category of role-playing where you're having a cathartic experience. Well, that's but thing, even right? then, yeah. Like, like wander home has this amazing section. It's probably the best section of the book. I mean, the whole book is great. So by wander home, et cetera. <laughs> um, but it has this, that has this one section that's like, um, uh, like losing is an invention made by games. You don't lose in real life. That never happens. Maybe you, maybe you miss a step. Maybe you feel embarrassed. Maybe you feel like you're a failure and no one's supporting you in this, but let's talk about that. And let's not talk, let's not frame it in sort of such strict terms. And I think for that kind of therapeutic type of game, um, that is is one of the most interesting aspects to it. Yeah, absolutely. What I'm hearing too is as you talk about your own game and as you talk about these, you know, like Wander Home, these are experiences that I think in some ways it's also easier to just set up a combat and roll and see who wins or loses. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that in order to have a narrative that's consistently interesting, you have a story you want to tell, but because it's a game, it's also a highly interactive experience where the other person, the person playing the game has to reach back and make it come alive. Mm. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm personally down for most things, right? But, you know, people are shy. I can be shy. How do you draw people into a game like this? So that they're going to get the maximum best experience possible. Cause I feel like with a, with a, with a game of this nature, you have to give a lot to get a lot. Yes, for sure. And I think, that's what I was talking about earlier about knowing what experience you want from a game, from a role-playing game is really important because role-playing games represent a, a sort of intimacy, not necessarily uh, encouraged by adults of a certain age. And um, that is uh, sometimes difficult for, uh, to get people into. I, I work with kids. I do D and D for kids and something I've noticed uh Obviously, they get into it. They love it. But um, the fact that when you fail, nothing happens is very difficult for them. There's a sort of frustration tolerance that you learn as an adult that kids don't yet have access to, where it feels, it, it, it feels um, yeah, again, like they're being punished with boredom, which is the worst punishment of all. You're playing a game. You want to have fun. And when you, uh, you know, have to spend half an hour waiting for your turn in your initiative order and you attack twice and you miss both times. It's as if you did nothing at all. And that's, Oh, that's, that's punishing. Um, and in that way, for people who think like that, for people who, who uh, find that increasingly frustrating, um, I think there's very little obstacle to getting into a game like PBTA. It's, it feels more like suddenly everything you do has consequence. Every time you roll a die, the narrative hinges on that moment. Um, but for some people that can be a little alarming, <laughs> you know, there's, uh, there's a comfort in the repetitive, you know, um, uh, us versus them. If I fail, nothing bad is going to happen to me, you know, like it's okay. Um, and, uh, there's also a sense of, um, increased intimacy with the expectation that you need to be role-playing at least in some aspect, um, more so than in D and D perhaps, uh, in, at least in mechanical. Uh, and I don't know, it's, it's a good question. I think 
there's an increasing focus in tabletop games uh, and in LARPs um, from certain aspects of the community uh, to increase the amount of safety tools and um, other such mechanized uh, ways in which to modulate the experience for people that uh, I really want to encourage. I think Monster Hearts, which is another PBTA game, I highly recommend it. Um, it's about uh, teenagers. It's like a teen drama, but urban teen drama, right? So uh, you, you're you struggling with anger as a teen, but that also means that you're a werewolf, you know? And uh, it's great. It's a great game. It actively talks about like sex and and drama and and bullying and uh, other very touchy subjects about youth and you're playing as a kid. So I think that game has one of the best. Um, if you ever want like a good example of how to frame something in a way that makes the players feel safe and tries to as much as possible to, to get it to um, be a, a consensual experience. That is the game I would uh, I would recommend most highly, um, and I think those uh, more cathartic exp uh, experiments, um, no dice, no masters, um, also do that very well in a different way, of course. Um, like the X card is a great example. The um, uh, the the hard lines and the sort of soft lines um, system is also very good. Like all of those, I think. Um, they weren't invented by these games, but they were. Uh, they those games took them and and, and tr tried to give them a wider audience, which I really like. One thing that's very interesting to me about this conversation is that it's also clear you've played a whole bunch of different role playing games. And okay, so just from my experience with D anD D, rolling a character, even starting to get into an adventure with all the books and all the information, <laughs> it's kind of exhausting. <laughs> And I say that as somebody who like loves games with multiple rule books. <laughs> right. Like, and so I think of all the games that that is, that is the closest maybe to a, to a, uh, 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 a, a board game experience. There are board games that actually try for that kind of experience where you roll a character and stuff, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. But it leads me to ask, are, so when we're talking about these, you know, power by the apocalypse experiences or these, you know, other ways of role playing, are they also easier to just pick up and play? I mean, right. are there role playing games out there with just lower overhead or people <laughs> who are really into tabletop, just, just going through this startup process again and again for games. Cause they're just that interested. Yeah. I think, I think there's this really interesting, fascinating phenomenon where, um, a lot of people are are a little shy about leaving D and D because that's where they were first introduced. There's a large community that supports them. You know, D and D Beyond is an amazing resource, um, uh, and yet you're totally correct in assuming that D and D and strategy games in general, sort of games with, for instance, um, expect you to have like miniatures and a map prepared for some combats you know not everyone does this i love that kind of part of dnd you know i love painting minis and like using them on my players and stuff um but it's a lot of like stuff you have to do to get the true dnd experience uh and for monster hearts for instance you just buy the book what's like 30 dollars that's it <laughs> you know it's all theater of the mind right uh because you don't need to have this strategic aspect that's not what the game is about um yeah absolutely it's it's uh most most of the games I've been talking about here are far less, uh, far less intense in terms of the amount of stuff you need to get before you, before you enter them. That being said, it is a big transition. I've seen a lot of people struggle with going from the assumption, the neutral fail state assumption to, Oh, these roles aren't, do you succeed or fail? They are what happens in the story and how can we make it interesting? Um, so I'm not going to may say that that's absolutely something that people can struggle with if they're used to, for instance, D and D. Um, but yeah, it, it's way less, way less overhead. <laughs> uh, how, so this is, so when you say theater of the mind, I'm assuming that means, you know, for example, to play Rapscallion, you don't actually need a, a fake ocean with a grid on it and a pirate ship and yeah. a little pirate and um, some hats. I mean, Raps that might be fun, actually. But Rapscallion actually, uh, Rapscallion actually does uh, ask you to make a map 
um, but it's sort of an overall map where you can like put X marks the spot and things like that. Um, and it has specific instructions for like just doing it on a piece of paper, right? Um, so that is like an overhead, I suppose. Uh, you need a piece of paper. Um, but uh, uh, yes, you're, you're correct in assuming that they don't need uh, <laughs> miniatures and things like that, um, for sure. So we talked a lot about tabletop, you know, role playing that you can kind of do just in mm -hmm. your living room. Uh, but you are also uh, fairly heavily involved, at least from my perspective, in LARPing. How interconnected are those two things? And also, do you want to just tell people what a LARP is, just in case they don't know? Right. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, LARP is a live action role play game. Um, I think the thing that differentiates it from a tabletop game is that it attempts at some kind of immersion um, as much as possible. It, you know, LARPs have mechanics just as any game does, but it, 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 as much as possible, it attempts to disguise those mechanics under a veneer of reality. Um, and I think a lot of people have done LARPing without realizing it. I think like those um, fun party games that are like murder mystery and you get your own little part um, like little parlor games like that. Those are for sure LARPs. That's what a LARP is. Um, and uh, they're not to say there aren't very mechanically heavy LARPing, um, but for the most part, a lot of LARPs, especially parlor LARPs, which are smaller scale, like room, what like room sized LARPs, um, uh, definitely attempt to lower the amount of mechanical overhead that you need to, that you need to learn. Um, because the idea is that it's an immersive experience. Um, you come in and the, maybe a good parlor LARP, uh, again, I, the, the ones I know best are the ones I've run, so I'm so sorry, but uh, I ran this, uh, this parlor LARP game that was a spoof on What We Do in the Shadows, which is a great, um, uh, a great movie and series. Um, highly recommended. Silly vampire stuff. Uh, foolish, foolish vampires. Vampires not taken seriously is what I would call it. Um, and the idea is that, like, it's set in Boston in the same sort of universe. And all of the vampires are coming together uh, and they're going to have to figure out, like, you know, they're, they're, the leader of their cabal just died and they're all trying to, like, infight vote on who's, who's going to go next. Um, uh, and uh, that's the parlor LARP, right? It's set in a room and maybe you have some props, like, ooh, they're, they're doing it in a back, back room of, like, a, a, a bar so let's like put some like coffee on the side or something, but it can be very theater of the mind, which um, does mean uh, essentially like, and it's used in D and D as well. Like if you say I'm running D and D as theater of the mind, that means that uh, you're not using a board. You're not using miniatures. You're uh, just imagining it in your head. And um, that is sort of the default assumption of most, most other games. Um, and for LARPing, theater of the mind, I think, would describe, or black box LARPing, I think is, uh, I've also heard it called freeform LARPing, uh, where uh, relatively few props, um, a little bit more imagination required versus sort of a 360 fully immersive experience. You know, you get to like, they're called, I think they're called castle LARPing or like, uh, uh, yeah, like, like, because, you know, in Europe, they would do it in castle, they would rent out a castle. And then you would pretend to be people in the castle and you full dress, you know, like it's all almost like historical reenactment, I would say, is sort of adjacent to that almost. Um, uh, yeah, there's a there's a wide variety of things you can do with LARPing. Um, but the typical example is um, you, you, you have to be getting up and role playing and acting, essentially, um, in a way that you don't necessarily with tabletops where you still, you know, it, it's still... Um, within a mechanical framework um, where many of those elements that would be replaced in LARPing with um, real life props and uh, role play um, and a tabletop is simulated through dice and other mechanics. Oh, that's super interesting. I will confess my first, uh, my first experience of seeing someone LARP was the Fear of Girls series on YouTube about like two lonely guys who Never play Dungeons and Dragons together by themselves. And I'm pretty sure the humor has not aged well. A lot of it's kind of sexist <laughs> and homophobic. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, no, but no. I, I remember Fear of, of Girls. History. 
<laughs> and I remember just watching some guy yelling magic myself and throwing, throwing something at someone. <laughs> and like, that's it. Yep. So uh, that's I, it sounds like actual LARPing is very, very different from what people are kind of joking about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, so, so like my experience, yeah, there is there, I think there's like this video that circulates whenever someone talks about LARPing with it, which is, uh, a guy who has like little packets and he, and he throws it at someone and goes fireball 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 <laughs> and that is you know that's the vision um and i i was i i i also started larping when i was in college and when i started it was like a college run larp so it was very low tech right i ended up running that larp for several years and um it was i was very nervous to get into it you know, it has a reputation for being like the ultimate nerdy activity. Um, but it also, I was like very skeptical that college students could act. Like I felt like, oh, it's, this is going to be like, this is going to be kind of embarrassing. You know, I feel like I'm not going to, I'm just going to be around a bunch of people who are like trying really hard. And it wasn't true. Like these college students, they, most of them were, were, were quite nerdy and, and fairly socially awkward, but being put in a LARPing, like, you know, if, if you're entering a LARPing scenario, it's amazing what people can do. Um, a lot of the time people won't necessarily act too much. They'll act within their, the realm of their willingness and experience. They'll, they might right. act as some sort of exaggerated version of themselves. That's often pretty, pretty much the case. And, uh, like people can do that very well. And I was surprised by how like just genuine and, uh, cheerful and, uh, uh, how much of a good community it ended up being. And that has remained true for even the stuff that I've done outside. I've done a few boffing warps, which boffing, boffing is the descriptor for uh, when you attempt to facilitate combat through fake weapons, foam weapons, okay. usually. So uh, boffing, a boffing weapon would be like a, a, a special foam sword. And there are very specific rules for this. Um, of a variety of qualities to make sure it's safe. You know, you have to have a specific kind of thickness of the foam. It has to be a specific length with a, like the, the PVA pipe underneath it has to be like, uh, you know, a specific brand and stuff like that. Um, so it's very, it's very codified already. It's a, it's a pretty uh, common thing. And boffing larps are the ones that you see often on the media, right? Like you go out into the woods and you find a cabin or some such, and then you have some, you know, you have like a Nerf gun or a, Hmm, a stick that is <laughs> foamy, you know, so that you don't hurt people. And then you go out and you, and you hit people with sticks. Um, that's boffing. <laughs> <laughs> so actually you stumbled on earlier what I was kind of hoping we would talk about too, which is, so a lot of the language, even that we're using to talk about these LARPs, you know, mm. black box, theater of the mind, props, acting. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is, this is very much, you know, um, I, I think that we all think about like, you know, drama kids and how they love to act. And they sure. Like they, they like to be this. So, but, I, I, but the other things that you say indicate that, you know, LARPing is really not necessarily about being a great actor mm -hmm. as much as it is about being willing to be in the moment. So yeah. how good do you really have to be at getting into a character and acting and performing to be a good LARPer? Uh, well, I think the di main difference between acting and LARPing is that LARPing is making it easy for you they're immersing you in this emotional experience. There's a, there's a term that you will often hear uh, LARPers use called bleed, LARP bleed, which refers to the phenomenon where the, uh, the emotions of your character become your own. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have, uh, I think, I've, I've heard different terms for it, fall, uh, LARP, uh, LARP fall, where after you and leave a LARP and go back into the normal world, there is this mixture of emotions where you had all of these major emotions that had an effect on your life. You were fully immersed, like in a boffing LARP, for instance, you are fully immersed in this world and it becomes real for you for a while um, in a way that I think for an actor, obviously surrounded by cameras or on a stage, it can't be. The actor has to right. make that moment. And in LARPing, the moment is made for you and in concert with many other people's moments. And that can be a beautiful thing. It can be very powerful. Many people come into LARPs wanting to bleed. They want to, there's a specific kind of LARP um, 
uh, that 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 aims for that sort of thing. I think it's sometimes called a, you know, crying in the mud LARP because <laughs> you know that's the thing, but that's the emotion they're going for, you know. Uh, but uh, not everyone wants that. Obviously, some people just want the hit with sticks. Um, but that is an essential part of LARPing that that exists for a lot of people, and I think that's really fascinating. You know the the interplay between having to leave this experience that was exceptionally real, except that it wasn't. The only the only thing that wasn't right. real about it was the fact that it was not real. Um, everything else was very real. And then you have to go back to your life and be like, how do I reconcile these emotions that were exceptionally real to me, um, but that have no bearing on my life right now? Um, I think people like that for the therapeutic quality of it. I haven't experienced much LARP leave myself, but... Um, uh, I kind of wish that I did it more because <laughs> it feels sort of like a cathartic release almost for a lot of people. Oh, that's super interesting. I, I also think we're touching on a lot of things where, you know, I think people see LARP, especially as a very vulnerable thing to do. For sure. And yeah. I, I think a lot about how, you know, even with games, right. I'll have people look at me funny. Not, not so much anymore. Board games are hot now. Uh, but mm-hmm. you know, that's what you do for fun. You just go play, board games with other people like as if playing a game is somehow trivial right Mm, and i think that we also see pretend as something that's for kids and Mm. that can't be really really moving yeah Uh, how do you you know i mean i'm assuming if you're willing to try a larp you're already past that barrier but like how do you push people you know further into being willing to do this And, and you know what would you say the benefits are for somebody who's skeptical it sounds like catharsis is a main one yeah, it's an amazing question. Um, uh, the thing is, I, I wouldn't want to push people into it because it is it should be opt-in. And like I said, there are, there are LARPing things that have become more and more popular to my great uh, uh, joy that try to make it safer for people. Mm-hmm. People who may not want that fully immersive experience. People who may want to be like, okay, our characters are getting into a romance, but we need to go out of character to talk about that. Right. Um, how how do we do that in this in this LARP that like what you see is what you get is a term used in LARPing. Like what you see is what you get, meaning everything need should feel as realistic as possible. Mm-hmm. How do you do? How do you facilitate that if you're not comfortable with certain things? Like, right. do you just become comfortable by lieu of acting? No, that's not how it works. So um, there, uh, that's becoming more popular. It wasn't always. I think for boffing LARP specifically, it's sometimes something people aren't used to because they're like, oh, this is just combat, combat, you know? And for those people, it might not be safety rules become a question of like, okay, you know, no rhino hiding, which is like pretending you don't get hit by blows or whatever. Um, And I I think that in order for it to work for people, you need to be into it. I I don't want to pressure anyone into doing it because it can be very... um, it can be intense. Like I, I am a very easily overstimulated person <laughs> and LARPing can be a lot, you know, it's a like uh, at its height for me anyway, like people do it much more like frequently, but you know, a boffing LARP is often a full weekend. You come in on Friday and you stay in character until Sunday afternoon. And that's like so much for a lot of people. And that's understandable. Um, and uh, but what I would say to people who are even tentatively amused or interested is that it's, you know, it, it's it's much just because it's silly does not mean that it is uh, not fulfilling and wonderful. In fact, it can be fulfilling and wonderful because it is silly. <laughs> um <laughs> Yes, on this we both very much agree. So it sounds like you both love to play and you like to run events as DM, as, you know, are you still the DM or GM for a LARP? Is that still the title? Um, not right now. Um, I am, the LARP I'm, I'm helping to create is not yet mm-hmm. run, obviously. LARPing, there's a whole debate right now about whether you can in fact LARP in a pandemic safe environment. <laughs> um, and I think the assumption I've heard most people go is like, yes, LARPing online is fine, but as long as it's, you know, it, the the format of the story has to be online. So like maybe you're right. a bunch of scientists who are talking to each other on the comms as you attempt to fix the spaceship. Um, 
I've seen that happen. And that works pretty well. Uh, oh, that's cool. But obviously we don't want to do a, like a boffing LARP is not safe in the pandemic environment. So no one, no one wants to do that. Um, so instead <laughs> we are, we're creating the system for it in preparation for it to be, um, for it to be uh, run at a later, safer date. Awesome. What I was going to ask is, do you feel more comfortable in the game runner role or in the player role? Like, do you have a preference at this time or is it important to do both to get the most out of it? Well, this, this sort of delves into psychology, doesn't it? Uh, well, <laughs> yes, actually, I do. I, I actually find I've played quite a bit, obviously, but I actually find that um, running a game is much easier for me. Um, my skill set is more catered towards it. And I will say for anyone who does um, tabletop RPGs, for anyone who does LARPing, uh, uh, being one of the players is a talent in and of itself. Uh, there is a sort of improvisational ability, a sort of wonder, a sort of willingness to wait, uh, mm-hmm. a willingness to let go of certain control um, that is essential to any like really, really good player. And you can be a good player. It's not just, you know, the GM's role for anything. There are some games that don't have GMs in them. Um, and I think that that's something that I, I would love people to take away. Is like, you can be a good player. It's okay to be a player and you can be a really good one. Uh, you can, you can yes and, you can improvise, you can uh, bring snacks. It's always an important one. Uh, you can uh, have this you can, you can help create this experience. Uh, in many ways, I think the players are just as responsible for any of the game runners or GMs or whatever you might call them for making the experience happen. Um, and that is more or less true with different games, but all games have that balance, that inherent quality of there. there is a large part of this that no one is in control over. It is up to the whim of this conglomerate mass. <laughs> Uh, so yes, I, I'm not very, I'm not as good at that part <laughs> <laughs> because when I come into, when I come in and be a character, my natural assumption is like, okay, you have to make a role for yourself. You have to decide what your tiny piece of the story is. And what I end up wanting to do is being like, okay, GM, what's your goals here? Just tell me what they are and I'll help them. I'll make a character <laughs> for them, you know? And that's just that's just casting for a LARP. That's just what I'm doing. That's not what being a player is, so. Oh, interesting. Uh, do you find that you are, when you're running the game yourself, are you more delighted when players surprise you or does it stress you out because you have to then roll with their punches? Oh, it delights me. It delights me. I think there's a lot of, um, there's a big, there's a sort of a culture in tabletop RPGs of like, Ooh, I'm the evil DM. Ooh, I'm evil. Ooh, I like to punish my players. Ooh, haha. You don't cross me, otherwise something might happen to you. And I hate that. I hate it. Like obviously it's mostly in good fun, but a lot of a lot of uh, GMs take it seriously. Uh, and that's absolutely not what the role is, in my opinion. Your role is to make the players' lives really cool and fun and interesting. And um, that's why I really like PBTA. Uh, for that strength specifically, there is uh, this beautiful sensation of like freedom where I don't like for D and I need to prep at least two hours before I enter a session. Usually unless I've already pre-prepped, you know, yeah. for, for Rapscallion, I've been doing a play test for Rapscallion for the last more than a year now, year and a half. And I prep nothing. I come in completely, completely barren. Uh, and just let it happen. And and my players are always like, "Oh, you're doing great. This is amazing. Thank you so much." And I'm like, "This is this is not me. This is all you guys. <laughs> this is all you guys." Because it's this beautiful little flower. Everyone's gently tending to at the same time. Um, it, that's what that's what good uh, a good role playing experience feels like. It feels like uh, this is not mine and it is not yours. It is some someone else's and it's probably ours in a sort of characterized way <laughs> <laughs> so i think about this because i'm a teacher right so i yeah, run my i run a classroom and you know there's students who kind of hog a lot of the space and then there's students who you have to kind of encourage to mm. participate even when you can tell they have something to say uh, is that ever part of your role as the gm like do you ever 
tweak what's happening in the game or kind of inter- insert yourself in order to help with balance among the players if you've got an alpha or if somebody's really alpha. sucking up all the air. Alpha. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's absolutely part of it. So um, there's a balance there, right? So the, the first situation is, is that does that player want to contribute? Um, there are yeah. different kinds of players and certain players I would call audience members, not in a judgmental way. They like to hang out with their friends and they like to watch the situation go down and they find that really fun and they can contribute themselves, but it's not necessarily what they came here to do. Um, right. And dis- and figuring out whether that kind of person is, is willing and in fact finds it engaging to listen and, and, and be engaged in the spectacle from the sidelines. Um, is probably the first step. If, however, they appear, there are many cases in which, in order to find that out, I will attempt to uh, tempt the player, right? Uh, Give them something to do and see how they react. So in a role-playing scenario, that would mean um, ask them what their backstory is. Ask them what they like about the game. Ask them, uh, you know, whether they want a cool little magic item in D&D terms or... uh, what they think about this uh, NPC in their backstory and, you know, press and check, you know, everyone engages in the game differently. Some, some players don't want to role play because they find it kind of uh, a little bit jolting. Um, and for those people, you know, you get them out of their comfort zone, but only a little bit. And instead you ask them like, okay, what do you make? You're like, you're a tinkerer, right? What do you make? And they'll be like, Oh yeah, absolutely. And they'll get into it. You just have to find the in everyone comes into the game with an expectation and it's usually unspoken. Um, just like I'm sure everyone comes into a classroom with an expectation that's unspoken and you have to figure out what that is. Um, I, I'm sure it's much easier when you have say five players instead of a large classroom full of people. Um, well, this but, is the assumption the five players wanted to be there. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is a major difference. Um, uh, but like, I think everyone has an engagement point, an engagement facet of themselves that makes mm-hmm. them excited without maybe without them really noticing um yeah the other thing i'm hearing you saying that's interesting and i think that when people think about how to role play good right they might forget this is that it seems like it's also okay to kind of talk about your character while not being your character for sure if that makes sense like oh i want my character to do xyz is just as legitimately a way to play as I go up to the other pirates and I punch them in the face and say yeah. my pirate is better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think there needs to be that kind of flexibility. Um, I think a lot of people, let's do a and d thing again, because that's what everyone knows. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you are asked, uh, a lot of people will wait uh, for someone to make a persuasion check on an NPC they're trying to persuade. They'll wait until you say something persuasive enough first, which is not how any of the other game mechanics work right if you want to chop down a tree they don't go like okay get up try to chop this table in half let me see how that works oh now you can make an athletics check okay you've convinced me you know like that's not how it works but with with role-playing somehow the situation is often reversed which i find really interesting because that's how pbta works right the role play triggers the dice as opposed to the other way around um however that can be because you're courting, you're courting a certain type of player by doing that. Because some players would be like, can I just, my player is really charismatic. Can I just, you know, is it okay? If, and then they get really nervous because they're expected to come up with something really persuasive off the bat. Uh, <laughs> and that can be a deal breaker for a lot of people. If they have a, a GM who expects them to do that and thinks that's the fun part of game when in fact it's the most anxiety inducing. So right. yes, absolutely. I would, if a player were to be uncomfortable, I could say like, um, okay, I would, I would remove myself several steps from the situation and say like, what's, uh, what, what, what are you trying to get them to do? Okay. Um, what are you offering them in return? Are you offering them anything? Uh, maybe, and that can just be like, you're trying to seduce them or you're, uh, trying to be friendly, really friendly. Like, what are you, what are you giving them in return for this service? And framing it that way can be easier for people because they don't have to like come up with a fun way to say it. <laughs> right. Know? Like as someone who's a little neurodivergent myself, I can understand the uh, insane amount of effort that would put in <laughs> if, for certain people, you know? 
Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, just, I guess, one more serious question before we just go to the fun stuff. Um, sure. So how do you think, so you've, you've been a player, you've been a game master, and now you're an author of an RPG. How do you think that writing your own has changed the way that you experience role playing? Certainly, I think there is a privilege Mm -hmm. uh, of knowing exactly what the game that you wrote expects you to do. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So if I were to apply that to Rapscallion specifically, I could give you all kinds of answers. Like, uh, I know exactly how PBTA works now. Magpie Games, my publisher, is very, is very, is like specializes essentially in PBTA games and their editors have been able to uh coach me through some of the weirder or uh less well-known aspects of that system uh and they have like tons of playtesting experience where they like okay yeah we know often it is it is the question of of a period right a question of formatting a question of word choice because it's a narrative game so it must be framed narratively so right. how do you how do you frame this specific sentence to make it sound correct for a player? You know, like on the get into a scrap. How do you frame the good part narratively in a way that mm-hmm. encompasses all scenarios? You know, that, that kind of like tiny quibbles, you know, that really make the difference. And having been through all that it gives me a higher appreciation of PBTA games, um, as well as how they differentiate themselves from other games you know i would not be able to talk about the expectations that i've been saying and, and the specific small uh changes between that and say D that make all the difference i don't think i would be able to pinpoint that so specifically um so if anything the 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 writing gave me the ability to be like okay let me pick the players I want. <laughs> let me pick the players because I know what the players want from this game and I know what the, the, that the game can offer them to that. Um, so, so now when I, when I look at a game, I, I'm thinking like, okay, what do these players want out of this game and how can I provide right. that to them instead of, okay, which players might like this story I came up with, I guess, you know, like that kind of, mm-hmm. the, the kind of like higher level structural thinking. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the biggest, the biggest, uh, lesson to be learned, um, that I can take to other systems that aren't just this pirate game that I made up. Oh man, that's super interesting. Okay. So just a fun, fun little question. Uh, what's a, what role-playing game other than your own, of course, everyone should play Ref Scouting when it's available, obviously. Uh, would you recommend that people try if they're looking for something that's beyond just the sort of D&D Pathfinder world? Oh, uh, good question. Can I list multiple options? <laughs> yes. There are no rules on here. Except oh, the ones lovely, I lovely. make. So. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you must ask. Um, <laughs> well, if you like D&D, if you think D&D is fun, and you like the, the feeling of, like, the strategy aspect and the, um, uh, the uh, feeling of, like, righteous defeat of evil, you know, that kind of thing, I... I I, I would recommend uh, systems that are like it. Um, you don't have to go into like Power by the Apocalypse games, for instance, if you don't want to. Um, but if you've ever been frustrated by it, um, a good you still like D and D, perhaps, but maybe you want to try something different. There is a D and D equivalent for PBTA called Dungeon World, which you can try. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it as like the best PBTA game, but it is essentially D and D, but in PBTA form. So if you want to see, if you, if you want to have that, uh, uh, slow transition, that's a good gateway drug, I suppose. Um, and I've also seen monster of the week that uh, another PBTA game, uh, also be a good, uh, a good version of that for some people. Um, so, uh, and monster of the week is, um, very, uh, buffy, you know, very uh, like uh, like every time you get a, a mystery to solve, you your team of monster hunters, and you have to figure out where the mo- like what's happening, and eventually defeat the monster with the power of your like wit, and also maybe <laughs> you know uh, kicking kicking their ass a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so that's that's it. Those two 
Uh, I, I can see some flaws with those systems, but they're great ways of introducing someone who is used to a certain combat of play into PBTA games. Um, for really, really good PBTA games, Monster Hearts is still amazing. Uh, very, very good. Masks uh, is a game about teenage superheroes, um, sort of. Uh, and though I think it's also published by Magpie Games, and that, that one's a very, very good. Um, for those of you who like Root, the board game, there is a RPG for that. <laughs> <laughs> also Magpie Games. Um, so that's a way to, if, you, if you're interested in, in Root as like a system of like all these different factions coming together in this woodland and like what that looks like, you can now do that in role-playing form. Um, <laughs> also a PBTA game. Uh, and I'm trying, I'm like focusing on PBTA here because that's what I've been talking about. Um, Wander Home is the one I mentioned earlier that was a No Dice, No Masters game. So if you're interested in a game that is not, not, uh, that is much more an improvisational exercise framed in mechanical terms more than a strategic attempt at simulation of war strategy, story, etc. Uh, highly recommend that one. It's about um, you're a bunch of animal people who are making a journey. Um, and once you reach home, you are out of the story because the story is about the wandering and not the coming home. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a great game to do with like people you really trust, like a, a solid group of friends that you really, that you really like. Uh, yeah, I would say there's Urban Shadows, which is an urban fantasy game set in a city environment. That's a PBTA game. Um, oh, there's so many options. <laughs> Those are the ones that immediately come to mind, but I'll think of a billion others by the time you, you cut the, you cut the feed. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. I'm actually curious now. I need to like get some people together to, to humor me. Uh, but also, where can you be found online? So if people want to follow the progress of Rapscallion or talk to you about games or, you know, where, where, are, where can you be contacted? Oh, goodness. Uh, I have uh, a website um, that has like a contact me page. Um, uh, it's evanlee-davis.format.com. Um that's mostly for art, though. Uh, if you want to contact me more specifically or look at what I've been doing lately, I do have a Twitter, reluctantly. Um, uh, it's, I believe, Art of Whistler, all one word. Uh, Art of Whistler on Twitter. I also have a Tumblr, but that's more for fun. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, those of you who are listening know I can be found anywhere on the internet as Beyond Solitaire. Thank you so much, Jeff, for coming on here. This was awesome. I learned a lot. Hopefully everybody else did too. And this is fantastic. Thanks so much for having me. It was super fun to talk about what I like. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody out there, please like, subscribe, leave a nice comment, a question, and most of all, happy gaming.